Today, I have the pleasure of hosting Critical Materials Corner with two experts with us from Nickel 28. I have Anthony Molesky and Martin. How are you today? Great. Hey, Tracy, as always, really appreciate you having us on. Looking forward to chatting today. Yeah. And thank you both. Um, I just want to read one quote here from Dean Bristow's piece on Nickel 28, which I think is one of the fastest movers on the market right now. He writes here that um, you read this right. EV demand alone could consume about 50% of current global nickel produ production within the foreseeable future. Is that correct? Those, uh, those kind of stats are staggering and overwhelming in terms of consuming not only current supply, but future supply that we need to come on. So that, that's true. Although I don't know if in the current marketplace, we had nickel hit 1060 here uh, at close in London and, and uh, pressure to move it higher. I don't know if that's what's moving the market right now as much as um, inflation and, and just some other general dynamics. But certainly in the midterm, there's no question that the big driver and consumer of incremental demand is coming from not just electric vehicles, but also all aspects of the energy transition. You know, another example, of course, is battery storage for your house and uh, and these types of things. So definitely true. Maybe not what's moving the market at this exact moment. Okay, well, we're going to turn the floor here for a second to uh, Jack Lifton. Jack, you have been writing for quite some time about how the EV revolution is a myth. We do not have enough materials to <laughs> achieve the goals that the automotive companies are putting out there. Would you like to comment on nickel in general for us, please? One of, one of the big um, mistakes that the analysts make is that they're under counting or ignoring the other uses of nickel. Besides, besides uh, 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 batteries for electric vehicles. And it's as if those uses don't exist. Now, I don't know if there'll be enough nickel for the projected demands, but projected demands are not real demands. So for example, uh, China has said there'll be uh, at least 25% EV by 2025 production. Uh, that I believe China has said they'll be at they'll be at uh, fifty percent of EVs by the year two thousand thirty. I believe that also. I believe China has enough access to all the materials it needs, including nickel, uh, to to carry out those plans. It's the rest of the world I'm concerned about. I think that China's industrial policy, which mandates that has the materials it needs before it starts to produce things uh, is, is light years ahead of Western attitudes, which is, well, we'll just pay more, we'll get all we need. This completely ignores the reality of mineral economics and geology. That, that's my opinion. I think, I think, and I defer to Mr. Maluski, who knows a lot more about nickel than I do, but I, I think that we have a problem with almost all of these energy energy metals, maybe not with nickel, you tell me. I mean, one thing, Trace, that people don't talk about, I think it's important because I, I you know, I think always in commodity markets, and Trace, we've been doing this for, for 20 years here, um, sometimes you can overhype a situation and, and the sky is falling and, and this and that. And one thing I will say it's important to talk about is, you know, LFP batteries, are going to be a major component of the mix. And I think some analysts probably incorrectly um, don't take into account uh, a variety of battery types. And, and what I think you're seeing in China and, and most likely in, in the States, but in particular with Tesla, is a realization that everyone doesn't need you know, a battery that goes hundreds of miles. And in fact, a lot of really cheap cars that are just going to run around town, you know, the average person doesn't go more than two or three miles from the house every day. You know, that person can have an LFP battery. And that's relevant because if you're using a demand model based on, you know, uh, the, this sort of standard nickel battery, um, then you're going to show a massive shortfall. You're going to show that immediately. But I think if you have a more graduated model where you kind of have a mix of battery types, then once again, I, I think um, that makes the transition more smooth. You know, what, what I think as a nickel producer, we don't want to see is I, I don't want to see nickel go to $20 or something stupid. You know, that, that happened last cycle. I don't think that that's beneficial to producers. Um, 
you know, you, you then start to have conversations around um, switching to different metals, different technologies. And so I think a much more graduated supply, uh, excuse me, a much more graduated price increase, uh, you know, gentler going up makes a lot more sense for producers. And, you know, oftentimes hysteria around the supply and demand model is, is put into the market by promoters uh, trying to raise money for projects that need development dollars. I think we all know that story. We've all seen that story, been a part of that story a lot of times. And there's no question that they, 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 there's no question that the dynamics around nickel are exceptional. Maybe the best they've been since um, since you know the super cycle, the real super cycle. Uh, notwithstanding that, I do think there's more nuance in the way that this will roll out, and and I do think that um, that it'll be more graduated, and you're not going to see this massive nickel supply shock that's going to somehow disrupt the EV revolution. And instead, you're going to see a diversified uh, type of battery uses based on you know, kind of what the average Joe needs to use the car for. So this is my kind of two cents. I just want to briefly say that uh, for the first time, I completely agree with you. <laughs> I, I think, I, I think I, you're, you're the first uh, producer of, of an EV metal, I think, that's uh, got his head on his shoulders and is, is spouting pure common sense. Thank you. I, I think, Jack, you know, if you look at, I, I agree with Anthony too, if you look at car car manufacturers, they don't all sell a car with a six-cylinder or an eight-cylinder engine. You have four, six, eight, and diesel. And the same thing's happening with EV batteries. You, you have different chemistries for different needs and requirements. So, and I think car companies are hedging their bets on, as Anthony says, a, a lot of, a lot of uh, short-range cars or, or entry-level EVs are, are using a chemistry that is uh, deficient in nickel where high performance cars may be nickel rich. And I think you will find a balance. And also as, as recycling of, uh, of nickel rich batteries starts to take hold in the next decade or two, you're, you're going to see a lot of that material come back into the market. So that will help alleviate this uh, infinite demand that people believe will never be fed. And, and one thing that people don't focus on, I mean, in fact, it's a, it's a much bigger story uh, in terms of dollar size, anyway, any, any metric is stationary demand, demand for solar at your house or for the new development. And, um, you know, Tesla has done a fantastic job being out front with the power wall. However, it, it's kind of absurd to be using a lithium ion battery for that, you know, and, and um, instead things like lead, lead acid batteries, I hate to say it, um, you know, vanadium redox batteries and a bunch of other technologies uh, which are all being refined, uh, invested in, and, and ultimately rolled out in the coming years and, and, and decade will also um, kind of further uh, diversify the availability of different types of, of batteries and different options. And so um, I, think, I think it's a much more complex story, but you know, the market needs sound bites, the market needs, you know, there's only one way to heaven kind of, kind of sound bites, but in actual fact, we have a much more nuanced story that it's going to benefit a bunch of different technologies, battery types, and ultimately, if we're talking about a commodities audience or different different commodities, you know, um, over over say the course of a decade. Let me ask you a question about uh, the geopolitics of this. The, the Chinese are very aggressive in acquiring overseas for them uh, sources of these critical materials. Where do you think the West stands in having enough nickel owned or controlled? by Western companies uh, to compete in, in the next decade, over the next decade? Well, I mean, they're two different, as we all know, they're two different governments. And, uh, you know, China is investing on behalf of its people, effectively tax dollars, let's, let's call them tax dollars. And, you know, they're executing uh, a political strategy and they're decarbonizing. You know, I think when, when China looks uh, or has looked historically domestically at uh, things that upset people, you know, because ultimately they have a constituency. One of those was corruption and another one was pollution. And, you know, in addition to electrification and transitioning towards, um, you know, electric vehicles and batteries and solar, they're also doing things like moving industry out of the major cities, out of the path of wind. You know, they're doing a bunch of that and that's their prerogative. And I, I think uh, sometimes there's these sort of articles written as if they're doing something nefarious. I, I would actually argue that they're leading the world in some respects in environmental policy. And, you know, the West, not just America, but Canada and Europe to a large extent are embroiled in fights over 
should you get vaccinated? Shouldn't you get vaccinated? Like, did they just stick an electrode? I mean, just nonsense, right? And um, I don't foresee in the States or in Canada that uh, somebody's going to lay out a couple billion dollars to build a nickel mine, if there's even one to build in, in, in the States, you know, um, if it's not sitting in a for a national forest. And so I think it's a much more kind of complex conversation because on the one hand, I don't think China's doing anything wrong. And I'm not aware of any accusations other than the fact that the government is using effectively their taxpayer dollars to execute a government sanctioned strategy. So that, that's great. That's a great idea. Uh, the West doesn't have that same idea. And so, um, no, I, I don't think there are very many assets controlled and nor will there be any time soon. You know, look at, um, look at the, the projects in Australia. You know, these are big CapEx projects, multi-billion dollar CapEx projects that have challenges around grade, they have challenges around HPAL, they have challenges around power. Like, is anyone after the experience of Goro or after the experience of Embadavi, are they gonna like line up to put six, seven, eight, ten billion dollars in? I don't think anytime soon. So that makes Australia challenging. You know, you come to Canada with the exception of maybe Turnigan, Dumont that are nickel sulfide ore bodies both of which have, you know, a couple billion dollar capex, you know, no, no one's lining up as far as I can see. Everyone knows where those assets are. So uh, it's a more complex situation and we have a free market in the West. And if you're an allocator of capital uh, until maybe the last 10 days, just go buy tech stocks, <laughs> go, go buy the NASDAQ 100. Uh, the S&P last year was up 29%, 100% liquidity. Or you can buy some crappy little junior mining company with zero liquidity that's either going to be up 50% or down 70. So I, I think people don't put it all in context. And the reality is, if we believe in a free market system, there's been much better uh, places to put your capital for, for years and years now. And you know, if the moment arises when investing in these is a good idea, then you'll see money flow in and, and they'll get built. But I can tell you, Dumont, as far as I know, is fully permitted, shovel ready, $2 billion CapEx. Goldman has been running a process for eight or 10 months. Like, okay, Ford, go build it. Okay, Tesla, go build it. Okay, government of Canada, go build it. Well, well no one's building it. Uh, so, you know, that, that's a decision uh, that's being made. And I think sometimes China is wrongly accused of doing something nefarious. They're not, they're just implementing their, their public policy goals. I, I'm speechless. So. <laughs> because I, I completely agree with you. <laughs> okay, on that note, Critical Materials Corner this week with Nickel. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We have the team from Nickel 28, Martin and Anthony. Thank you. And, of course, Jack Lifton. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Tracy.